right now, let me introduce my panel today. In addition to Otis, we have Chris Tudor, a local attorney and former chairman of the Shelby County Republican Party, and Sam Hardiman, reporter for the Commercial Appeal. Thanks to all of you for being here. I want to start with the State of the State Address. Let's listen in just to a little bit of what the governor had to say when he addressed lawmakers earlier this week. Kind of gives you a flavor for what the whole speech was about. Members of the General Assembly, the state of our state is strong. And I look forward to working with you to make it stronger yet. And may we ensure that the beacon that is Tennessee, America at its best, shines brighter than ever before. Well, a lot of Republicans stand, I think I have 40 standing ovations in the course of that speech. Uh, let's show you some of the budget highlights uh, that are, are worth mentioning to people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a $52.5 billion budget total, uh, not an insignificant amount of money. Worth mentioning that $10 billion of that uh, came from a federal infusion of cash of COVID money. A billion dollars more for education in this budget. Uh, $82 million more for public hospitals. Uh, and he was really big on the education side of this oh, and yeah. how we're going to do school funding and, and all that. Uh, but but notice, he did not mention COVID once. Right. And uh, the state that's doing so well and one of America's best has been one of the highest in the nation when it comes to per capita deaths from COVID. And not paying that much attention to the ways to fight back against COVID, uh, Richard. Uh, you know, uh, I have yet, and I've been around here for a lot of years, I have yet to hear a governor say uh, we're, we're, we're at our worst or we're at our weakest. I expect him to say uh, the state of uh, the state is strong. Uh, and he did uh, talk a lot in a positive way about education. I, I think that's crucial. Um, although obviously a lot of the money that he's getting uh, to deal with it edu with education is coming from the federal government and it's something that a lot of Republicans in Washington voted against. Uh, but I do give him credit for making some sound sensible uh, proposals about education. But as you mentioned it, not mentioning COVID, when we still have uh, people who are in the hospital, we still have some people dying. Yes, COVID is coming down a bit, but don't ignore this crisis, which is still a crisis in the state, uh, and, and, and pretend as if it, it doesn't exist anymore. I think that was a major failure in the speech, uh, and, and a lot of people pointed it out as well. What do you think about that, Chris? I mean, does it strike you as ironic, at least, that one-fifth of the money of this budget came from COVID, COVID infusion from Uncle Sam, yet uh, it was not mentioned in the speech? I, I don't think it's ironic. I mean, that's just the way uh, a lot of state government uh, is funded these days is with the federal infusion of, of cash. I mean, I think you guys touched on the biggest points. I mean, we're getting one billion additional dollars towards K through 12 education. There, There's gonna be 600,000 Tennesseans under TennCare who have dental coverage. There's $250 million going to Tennessee State. Uh, you mentioned the hospitals. We could talk about um, the uh, the highway patrol. I mean, this this budget's a win all the way around. And <clears throat> excuse me, we may debate uh, whether Governor Lee should have uh, spent more time talking about this or that topic, but I think the fundamentals here are sound and. And, and, and let me just say that I agree with him that the state of the state is strong. You don't have to look at the, you don't have to look at the rankings of um, uh, of, of of where Tennessee stands uh, for bringing in new businesses. You, you just need to look at the uh, at the headlights heading in this direction from places like New York and California. It's a boom town. Um, we're we're doing a great job, and it's in no small part due to exceptional Republican leadership on these issues for the past decade. Um, Let me at least so that, on that first that point a little bit, Chris. You know, when uh, he, he had a lot of lines in there criticizing the heavy hand of big government, uh, criticizing deficit spending, uh, uh, spending our children's money, uh, like the big government uh, Uncle Sam is doing, yet took $10 billion from uh, as part of that deficit spending, and that was okay with him. You don't see that as a little bit ironic, at least? I just think that's the way the system works, man. I mean, I think probably uh, you and I have uh, have have made you know some critical comments personally about the way the tax code is structured, but that's not stopping me from taking the standard deduction, right? I mean, that's just the way it is. You know, we may not agree with the policy, but I don't. I think it would be, you know, absurd for for the state to refuse money, even if if he has you know policy disagreements with uh, with federal uh, taxing and spending. So Emma, I think we take advantage of the opportunity. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Well, let's your take on the on the state of the state speech and the reaction to it. 
Um, so one of the things that I sort of do when I watch a politician make a speech or I watch the highlights make a speech is try to kind of reverse engineer why they're talking about what they're talking about. And I think us in the media may have a uh, fascination with why he didn't talk about COVID-19, why the government didn't talk about COVID-19. But one of the most interesting things I saw shared this week was from, uh, I believe it was Steve Kornacki of MSNBC fame, which is a Monmouth University poll, which showed that 71% of Republicans and almost 70% of independents are ready to accept that COVID is just a part of their lives. And so I think when you have a governor who, as the great Natalie Allison, now Politico, but formerly the Tennessean reporter, has sought very hard to avoid a Republican primary and has done a lot of things to assuage the Republican base in this state, talking about COVID is not going to win Bill Lee votes and it's not going to help him avoid a primary. That's the way I think he sees it. It's very well, practical and probably true. Well, yeah, but, but one quick rebuttal to that. Um, <laughs> the, the state of the state uh, address should not be a political speech. Now, we know it is most of the time, uh, but he's talking about issues. He's talking about policies. He should be talking about things that impact everybody, not just Republicans. So I would push back on that. But I, I, I agree with Chris. Uh, Tennessee is doing quite well. Uh, financially, it is strong. I don't, I, don't, I don't take issue with that at all. And certainly with the issue around uh, we're getting a, a forward uh, assembly plan here, that's the biggest story of 2021. I, I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying that in a state of the state address, it should be less political, more policy driven, and recognizes the issues of everybody in the state, including people who didn't vote for him. All right, now we're going to talk about something very political, and that is the ouster of Senator Katrina Robinson of Memphis. Uh, we know that she was convicted on uh, federal charges, uh, fraud charges, uh, though many of her sentences were or her convictions were thrown out uh, in, in the process. Uh, nonetheless, she re really um, felt that it was unfair the way the uh, Republicans ousted her so soon before she even has been sentenced, not letting the process unfold. In fact, uh, there is a meme that's out uh, putting a picture of her right next to uh, Senator Brian Kelsey of Germantown and saying, look at how these two have been treated differently based on the federal charges against them. So that is kind of the, the, the temperature, I guess, from Democrats about how quickly this seemed to, to uh, proceed through uh, the state Senate. And what are your thoughts about it? Well, I'm, I just think let's, let's get it out there right away. Um, Senator uh, Katrina Robinson, or now former Senator Katrina Robinson, is a convicted felon. Let's not ignore that. Uh, although the n amount of charges have been whittled down to just two charges involving a very small amount of money. $3,500. $3,500 mm -hmm. when it was really in the hundreds of thousands originally. Uh, but the fact is that uh, she was convicted. Now the issue is what did the legislature, especially the Senate, have to lose by waiting to see if the federal judge in this case uh, will throw out those charges? I don't know that she will, uh, but there was, the, the Senate had no, nothing to gain, had nothing to lose by just waiting on that. And let's wait, to, now they've set themselves up here. If Brian Kelsey does get convicted, they won't have any choice here. Uh, and they will have to uh, expel him uh, before or, or, or he will resign. We'll see what happens if he is convicted, but they have set up a precedent here by doing this. Do you agree with that, Chris? Yeah, I, I agree with all that. I mean, th th with, with former Senator Robinson, um, she's been convicted of a felony, like Otis pointed out. The only thing that is left is sentencing. Um, and, and maybe we can argue back and forth about timing, but the reality is there's a rule, which is if you are convicted of a felony, you're gonna be removed from the state Senate. And uh, they held off on that, just like they're doing with Senator Kelsey, because in this country, you're innocent until proven guilty. Although Senator Kelsey is, is, has been indicted, uh, there has not been a trial. That trial won't take place until next year. Uh, there was a trial for former Senator Katrina Robinson. She was found guilty. We may debate back and forth the merits of that, uh, the extent to which uh, she was culpable, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is that she was convicted of a felony, and, and they applied the rule. And the only thing that's left is sentencing. So I think there's been a little bit of smoke and mirrors about what's really happened and some of the rhetoric but in reality it's the application of a very black and white rule and 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 they applied it and they should apply it to anyone in the future um republican democrat independent green party whatever it's the, the rules the rule and, and they need to apply it uh, fairly regardless of who it is 
I'm running out of time on the segment, so I want to move on to the medical marijuana issue, uh, which is surfacing again, Sam, in the State House. From what I can tell, there are three bills now that are current on this. One uh, is called the Free All Cannabis for Tennessee Act. A, a Democrat from Nashville is sponsoring that, and he wants not just medical marijuana, but recreational marijuana, too, to be legalized. Uh, there's a joint resolution uh, that would call for medical cannabis, a medical cannabis program, a tax of 4% on medical cannabis, and uh, another initiative that would just create uh, a ballot question in the 2022 election just to get voters' opinion on this. It's not even a referendum, but just to kind of see where Tennessee voters stand on this. So as you look at those three, do you see any of them having a chance, Sam? Um, I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's interesting because Tennesseans like to make fun of Mississippi for being one of the last to get everything, right? Uh, whether it be gambling or what have you, but you know, it's, it's interesting when it, come, when it comes to uh, medical marijuana, Tennessee remains the only Mid-South state anyway where that, that is not even legal after uh, Mississippi lawmakers found a way to pass it this past week. Right, and, and I think that Mississippi passing it opens the door for um, Tennessee to sort of ask the question, particularly around here, why not? Because you drive down Interstate 40, there's a reason that there's a medical dispensary you know, within two miles of the Hernando de Soto Bridge. Right. I mean, it's ease of access for people coming from a different place. So it really, I think, raises the question if you have both medical marijuana in Mississippi and Arkansas, people in the Mid-South are just going to go get it if they can across the border. And so why not? Why not have that here is a question. Yeah, I, I would expect a dispensary on State Line Road between uh, Tennessee and Mississippi, too, pre before too long. Uh, Chris, <laughs> why like you, what, are you, what are your thoughts about this? I got just a few seconds left on this topic. Yeah, I, I think, you know, this is a pretty Republican state, pretty conservative state, but libertarianism has always been a big component of, uh, of American conservatism. I think if it's prescribed by a doctor, I think you're going to see a lot of people get behind it. Uh, you know, there's that referendum in Arkansas. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if I see a passing. And Otis, which one? Do any of those three you think have a chance? Uh, the medical marijuana might have a chance uh, just because of the nature of it. I don't think any of those others will have a chance at all uh, because Chris is right. This is a very conservative state. This is an election year in addition to that. So, no, I don't see the others having a chance. Okay. We'll take a break.